two weeks ago, I made it all the way down through verse 8 and chapter 14, and so we will uh, pick it up there at verse 8. Actually, I made it down through the end of, of uh, verse 7, and so we'll pick it up in verse 8 here in just a moment. Um, one of the things I want to try to do tonight, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit challenging because there's just so much here, is I want to try to finish the chapter, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> it's not the end of the world if I don't, but uh, that being said, it's, it's, it's a... It's an awesome, awesome chapter. Um, so let's uh, look down there and um, let's uh, see what uh, John says there in verse 8. Now just remember, uh, we just had this vision of an angel there in verse 6 that was sharing the gospel. In fact, it's called there in verse 6 an eternal gospel. And so this chapter has a lot of angels in it. Uh, we're going to see them declare uh, judgment um, in, in, in our passage tonight um, in fact verse 6 you have the eternal you have a, uh, an angel that is <clears throat> preaching an eternal gospel uh, to those who live on the earth um, and if you remember I said something uh, that as far as I know this is the only place that you find an angel preaching the everlasting or eternal gospel and I do believe this is the same gospel that we have in our dispensation and so you have this angel preaching here one of my students came to me recently and said well burn what about um, for example, in the book of Luke or in the, the Gospels where um, the angels declare the coming of Christ, you know, Jesus is born um, and that kind of thing, especially to the shepherds. And so that got my wheels turning a little bit. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I do know that uh, this word here, eternal, euangelion, uh, which is the word for gospel, um, is um, the good news of Christ. And so it's not just going to be a declaration that Jesus came, like those early angels did, uh, or those angels did in the, the early parts of the Gospels. But it's also going to be uh, the fact that uh, people are called to trust in Jesus as their salvation. And there, there are two, verse 7, fear God and give him glory, uh, because his hour of judgment has come. And then worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So that's the eternal gospel that the this angel is is actually declaring and again you're not going to find that anywhere else um, as far as I know in in the scriptures uh, and the reason that is unique is because um, as you know in our dispensation our era our age this age of grace that we live in the gospel has been given to us to share and um, so things are so bad during the tribulation period of course there's a lot of death uh, we're going to see more death even in this chapter and more judgment even in this chapter um, and um, there are going to be people saved in the tribulation you guys have figured that out by now um, but this is almost a, a gasp a second gasp of God's grace if I can use that terminology that not, might not be the best word picture but this is a second opportunity if you will and God is just like that in all of his judgment he's continuing to reach out to men and say, trust in Jesus, it's not too late. And of course, uh, the text we've looked at, and the one we're going to see tonight even, uh, says that those who trust in the Antichrist, those who take the mark of the beast, it's too late for them. But obviously, there's going to be a lot of people here on planet Earth that are going to hear, if they're still alive, um, the eternal gospel through this angel. And um, unfortunately, however, it says this in, in verse 8 and this is where we'll pick it up and another angel a second one followed saying and by the way when you look at that in the Greek it carries with it the idea almost of he fo he's following right on the heels of this first angel so um, one commentator said the first angel preached the gospel and it was probably such a poor response that's why you got the second angel coming so quickly and here's what he says he says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, verse 8. She who has made all nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Uh, there in verse 8. And so that's a, that's a powerful verse where you see this second angel declaring judgment. Um, and then you're going to see a third angel come uh, there in verse 9 that's going to uh, pronounce um, damnation. And so you, if you look at these three angels, you have one angel declaring the gospel, the second angel following, declaring judgment, and then the third angel uh, beginning there at verse 9, declaring damnation. 
And so again, it carries with it the idea that most likely this first angel, him preaching the eternal gospel, was primarily um, and most likely unheeded by those who were alive uh, at this point in the tribulation period. Uh, now, I want, I want to draw your attention tonight on uh, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. And the reason that's significant is that in the book of Revelation, this is the first time you have the mention of Babylon. And um, you guys are going to see when we get over into chapter 17 uh, and um, even I think there's some in chapter 18, but we, yeah, chapter 18, 17, and 18, you're going to see a, um, a more vivid picture of Babylon falling. This is the first dec declaration of Babylon the Great falling and falling under judgment. And um, there's a rule, and this is a biblical rule, by the way, that applies even to the Old Testament. Um, and that is, if you come across a word and you want to kind of know its implications or know what it means, go back to the very first time it was used in the Scripture. So if you come across something later on in the, at the end of Genesis or Exodus of Leviticus or Numbers, um, go back to the first time that word was used in early, the early part of Genesis. In this case, um, it's the word Babylon, and this is the first time it's used in this book. But as you guys know, um, Babylon, that's not the first time it's used in the Scripture, right? So, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And so what you want to do is, is you want to, when you're trying to determine exactly what uh, John means by Babylon, um, you want to go back to the very first time the word Babylon is used in the scripture. Now, again, catch that. that, that what I just said right there is just a nice thing for you to always remember. Uh, anytime you come across a word, um, it's always helpful, uh, like one of the names of God, you know, El Shaddai, something of that nature. Um, go back to the very first time it was used, and, and, and that will help you determine uh, the meaning uh, that you're looking at um, in the text uh, before you. And so in this case, we're looking at what Babylon the Great was and what it is. Um, now, certainly, in John's day when this was written, uh, there was a literal Babylon, um, you know, an area that they would consider Babylon. And, of course, um, this word Babylon here meant more to those seven churches, just a particular area, geographical area. Um, you know, for us, it would be um, Iraq. You know, that area uh, is where um, old Babylon uh, once was. Uh, but nevertheless, um, for these seven churches, it meant more than just a geographic location this word Babylon for them carried with it the idea of idolatry and false worship and false religion and in fact um, uh, in the book of Genesis you'll find out that it was at Babylon that's the first place you have uh, and we call it really the cradle of all idolatry and false worship uh, back in the book of Genesis, chapters 10 and chapters 11. And, um, and uh, so um, when the scripture here declares that Babylon the Great in the future is going to fall, um, it's talking more than just a geographical area that actually is um, raised to the ground. It carries with it the idea of, of the idolatry and the false worship that takes place and you're going to see a little bit later it really this this section of, of revelation for me actually does not become uh boring in any way it actually ratchets up a notch when we start talking about babylon and because what you'll see is you'll see um the bible what the bible calls a whore and you'll see a um, unholy union we'll talk about this a little bit later between false religion and um, and also the state, the government, and uh, the military powers of the day. And so there'll be this unholy union between um, uh, the government and the, at this point the Antichrist and his leadership with um, uh, religion. And um, you're going to see it falling uh, in more detail in the future. And it's very challenging for us as the, as, as the modern church as it was for the early church as they read this. But um, when you look at this, um, you want to go back to the book of Genesis chapters 10 and 11. Now, we're, we're not going to turn back there. 
for the sake of time, but I'll remind you of what happened there. Um, as soon as Noah got off the ark, God said, fill the earth, you know, spread out over the earth. And, um, and uh, you know, Noah, I want you to essentially take the land. I want you and your sons to fill the earth. And the idea there was, was for um, the godly seed of Noah that just came on the hills and just survived the hills of the, the, the uh, flood was for them to cover the earth um, in righteousness. And, um, and so that was why when Noah got off the ark, you have this fill the earth idea. By the way, do you remember that's exactly what God said to Adam and Eve? God said to Adam and Eve, hey, multiply, fill the earth. And so that's the promise that is given. And again, God's plan was always for the earth to be covered with worshipers and believers. Um, but the Bible says something um, there in uh, Genesis chapter 10 as it talks about all the um, descendants of, of Noah and his sons. Uh, there was a man born there in Genesis chapter 10 by the name of Nimrod. Anybody here ever heard of a child named Nimrod? Uh, well, you've probably heard that terminology used as a um, um, derogatory term, right? I mean, if somebody is called a Nimrod, um, and certainly we should never use that kind of language, but if somebody is called a Nimrod, you know that that's used in a negative way, and it has a negative connotation to it. And uh, so you had this man uh, born by the name of Nimrod, and in the Hebrew, the word him or the name Nimrod literally means rebel so you got one of Noah's sons born uh, one of Noah's sons born and his name is Nimrod his name is the rebel and uh, you know my apologies go out to the University of Nevada Las Vegas uh, because they you know they have they're, they're called the running rebels but here right here you have the first running rebel if you will uh, because you know what Nimrod did Nimrod's the one that said rather than obey God and fill the earth Let's stop right here. There was a plane there. He said, let's stop right here. And, um, you know, we'll call this place Babel. And we will uh, build a tower to the heavens. You guys remember the story? We'll build this tower so far in the heavens. Um, and the reason we're building this tower is so that they can see that our name is great. So there's this pride aspect to it. When you read Genesis 10... Uh, it, it, there's a religious aspect to it that man now is going to be at the center of worship in that day. And um, as you guys know, uh, the, the thing that they did greatly displeased the Lord. So they did. They built this tower. It's called the Tower of Babel. That's the first time you have this terminology, Babel. Now later on here, Babylon, it's the first place you have Babel in the Scripture. Uh, so they built this tower. And they're holding out their suspenders, you know, and uh, they're giving one another fist bumps and they're walking around in all of their pride and they're saying, look at what we built and this kind of thing. And they're worshiping, um, you know, themselves. It's a, it's a form of idolatry and false worship. And I love what the Bible says there in Genesis chapters 10 and chapters 11, there in chapter 11, specifically, I think, is, is uh, the chapter where... The Bible says, and the Lord, I love this, um, came down to see it. <laughs> now, don't miss that. It's, it's, if there's humor in the Bible, there it is. I mean, think about it. They built this tower that reached up to, the, to what they called the clouds. And it, the, the, the writer says there, Moses says there, and the Lord, he had to come down to see what they built. <laughs> <laughs> you know are y'all tracking with me a little bit i mean that's what you have there you got the lord who has to come down to see what the these so-called great men have built for themselves and as you guys know um it was there at the tower of babel that god confounded their languages and because at at that point men all spoke one language and by the way, it's the height of hubris if you think that language was English, <laughs> the king's English. Um, I'm not sure what it was, but they all spoke one language. And so God confounded their language and, um, and they could no longer communicate. And then he takes them and he covers the earth. Remember his plan? Cover the earth, multiply and cover the earth. And so God takes his sovereign plan into his own hands and um, he covers the earth with them. Um, 
And all of a sudden now you have um, people speaking different languages living in different parts of the world. By the way, if you want to know uh, why people speak different languages, it goes back to the Tower of Babel and God spreading them out over the face of the earth. Uh, so um, anyway, so there's your first mention of Nimrod. There's your first mention of Babel. And so it is literally the cradle of all idolatry and false worship. So that any time you have Babel, you have a place literally called Babylon. And especially here when you see Babylon the Great falling, um, it is a tremendous picture of God's judgment upon idolatry and false worship. And so again, when we get into chapters 17 and 18 of Revelation, we're going to see that in detail. We're going to see where God judges all idolatry and all false worship. And so Babylon the Great, she who has made all the nations drink of her wine. What about that imagery there? What does a person do when they drink wine, particularly fermented wine? They become inebriated, drunk by it, right? And so um, all the nations that drink of the wine of the pathos or the passion um, of her immorality okay so this is a this Babylon the Great is spoken of here and um, and spoken of as somebody the nations have been drinking from and again false worship idolatry and not only that people have be, have been made drunk by um, her immorality and so think about that word picture Babylon here cares with the, the idea of an unfaithful woman who's prostituting herself to the nations. And that's what false religion is. False religion is a, is a, it's a prostitution, and it's, it's the devil's prostitution to the nations. And um, so it's not the first time that we've seen the word immorality used, um, not meaning physical. They were laying with her physically, but it carries with it the idea of spiritual immorality right and so um, uh, think about that for just a moment so this Babylon on the great this is just a little short remember we're in the interlude area there's an interlude here uh, on our timeline and we haven't gotten yet to the to the uh, the seven bowls uh, we're about to get there but there's an interlude here and in this interlude you've got this this declaration that Babylon on the great has fallen and so even all of those that have um, become drunk on the wine and the passion and there in verse 8 um, I'm going to look it up and or wrath the wrath of her immorality those that have gotten uh, uh, inebriated by the passion of her immorality um, they are going to be judged during this time does that make sense a little bit so again it's just a little verse that gives us a glimpse but in chapter 17 and 18 we're going to see this in more detail okay um, now real quickly just in terms of application what would the seven churches have drawn from what I just said I mean they would have known that their Babylon in their day would have been Rome that was around them okay um, remember those seven churches they're surrounded by idolatry right they're surrounded by spiritual fornication. They're surrounded by people that are getting drunk on the Babylon, the false religion, and the idolatry of her age. So they're, they're, these seven churches right here, they're, they, they're kind of in their holy huddle. And if you remember, five out of seven of these had given in to the idolatry and given in to the spiritual fornication. They were, you know, they were allowing false teachers to come in um, uh, only a couple of them were still still staying faithful to the Lord. The other five were in, in serious um, trouble uh, because they were caving to their culture that was around them. And so when they read this, and when they would have read this or heard this, when they would have heard that Babylon the Great one day is going to fall, they would have been reminded and they would have been challenged not to give in to their current culture. Does that make sense a little bit? They would have been reminded, you know what? We're in the minority. Um, so many other churches have fallen, and they've begun to bow before the Caesar of the day and, and the, uh, the current um, idolatry of the day and the false worship of the day. But 
knowing that that whole system one day is going to crumble and there's no salvation in it, they would have read that and they would have taken a tremendous amount of uh, encouragement from it. And they would have basically read it and said, Babylon's going to fall. This Babylon that we live in, this, this time and this age that we live in, it's also going to be judged by God. Therefore, we're not going to acquiesce. We're not going to give in. We're not going to capitulate to the current milieu that we find ourselves in. Does that make sense a little bit? Now, that's the seven churches. That's what they would have taken from it. What about us now? I want you to fast forward now 2,000 years. These churches have come and gone. You and I live in Babylon. Babylon is alive and well today. Is it not great Babylon? Um, so do we live in an age that has um, idolatry? <laughs> Everywhere that we look, absolutely. Worship of, of um, the world, the flesh, and the devil in so many various ways. Uh, in the 21st century, I call the United States Candyland. And I don't mean that negatively. I'm proud to be an American. I love the fact that I'm born by the grace of God in the United States of America. And I'm, I, I, I love our country. And I love the blessings that we have in our country. At the same time, um, we live in Candyland. It's so easy for us to fall in love and get drunk on the current Babylon that we live in. In, in, in the world that you and I find ourselves struggling to serve Jesus in. And so it can be, you know, Babylon can be false religion. So um, outside of Christianity, the fastest growing religion right now is Islam, Islam, Islamic religion. Um, uh, you have other false religions and false cult, cults right around here, right down the road. We've got a Jehovah's Witness church, literally just right down the road down here. You've got Mormonism. Who's trying to pawn itself off as being a true religion? Uh, you have so many other um, um, heretical um, off branches or, or branches and shoots off of uh, what we call genuine Orthodox Christianity, uh, and uh, so many false cult cults and so much worldly, godless, at the end of the day, paganism that's being perpetrated around us. And um, so we have a lot of people that are prostituting themselves to the Babylon that, that they live in. And so um, we need to be reminded before we kind of cave, as we kind of find ourselves in the minority, as we kind of find ourselves being swallowed up by the darkness, we need to be reminded, hey guys, this Babylon that we are currently in, this Babylon that so many churches are selling out to, and given into this false worship and this idolatry and this spiritual fornication that so many are taking part in, guess what? We need to hold uh, our faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Uh, because that system, this whole world system, this whole false religion is going to one day be judged by God. And so here's your text that says, um, Babylon the Great... And she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality, it is fallen, fallen. Two times it says fallen there. Did you see that? Um, in the Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew language, when they wanted to emphasize something, they repeated it. Okay? So Jesus would say, um, even in his day, not just verily I say to you, he would say, verily, verily I say to you, or truly, truly I say to you. Um, and so that was a way that they emphasized. Well, right here, it's not just fallen, it's fallen. Fallen is Babylon the Great. There's an emphasis there that, hey, I want you to know, don't give in to it. Don't give in to the idolatry. Don't give in to the spiritual fornication. Don't bow before the false gods that are being worshipped around you. Serve and worship Jesus. And that's the challenge that we have um, even uh, in our culture today. Does that make sense? So you got Babylon the Great. Uh, falling there and again in uh, and I'll say it for the third time Revelation 17 and 18 you'll find more of that in detail uh, so then you have another angel a third one following them saying with a loud voice now remember um, I said we have the gospel by one angel you've got judgment right there by the second angel Babylon has fallen uh, Babylon the great has fallen and then you have um, essentially hell following by the third angel, um, which is going to be eternal destruction. 
look here uh, at this third angel. A third one, and by the way, these angels must have been Baptists because they love three points, did they not? Did you catch that? Um, but anyway, um, then another angel, a third one, followed them saying uh, with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, head, um, he also will, now notice this language, drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now let's stop right there for just a minute. In verse 9, we've already talked about the mark of the beast some in here. We haven't spent a lot of time on it, but you, you know there's a mark of the beast. You're, you're already familiar with the unholy trinity. And it says here, this third angel says that if you take the mark on your forehead or on your hand, um, you will also, this is the declaration, drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, you see the word play there? They were getting drunk on Babylon's wine. Were they not in the previous passage? Um, they were getting drunk on Babylon's wine. But right here, he says, you're going to drink of a wine, and it's the wine of the wrath of God. Uh, now, the word wrath there, I wish I had time to you know, do a, a study with you there, but that is going to offend a lot of especially modern day liberal Christians. And when I use the word liberal, I'm not talking about the political kind of liberal that you're used to hearing um, CNN as opposed to Fox or something like that politically. That's, the word liberal carries with it the idea of a Christian or a professor in Christ, one that professes Christianity, that um, takes a more liberal view of the scriptures. So they would discount um, the virgin birth. They would discount miracles. They would discount things of that nature and try to explain them away in a very naturalistic sense. And so um, uh, a lot of modern-day liberal Christians are offended by the idea that God might be a God of wrath. You guys remember a few weeks ago when we did those atonement theories? One of them uh, was, the, um, was the word that we studied, propitiation. It means to satisfy the wrath of God. Jesus Christ absorbed the very wrath of God. And so right here, you have the wrath of God being spoken. Um, and this was a warning for the seven churches. And it's a warning for us because a lot of us today treat God's character like a buffet restaurant, right? Um, and you guys, you know Christians like this today. You know, Brother Vern, I love God's mercy. I love his love. And I'll take a big helping of peace. And, man, give me some of that joy. And I love Jesus, and I love his love for me, and I'll take a lot of Jesus. Give me a lot of that. Uh, but when it comes to God's justice, don't want any of that. Don't want any of that. God's wrath. Oh, God being a God of wrath. No, don't want any of that. Um, God's holiness. No, don't want any of that. And they treat God's character like a buffet restaurant. Are you all tracking with me? And really what, what, what has been done, when you have a person that, that takes the God of the Bible and, and they remake the image of God in their own image. Basically, at the end of the day, what they have is a cosmic Santa Claus who's sitting on the throne, not the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? Somebody says, in the book of Genesis, God created man in his image. In the book of Romans chapter 1, man returned the favor. And so we create God in our own image. And so anybody that says, I don't believe in a God of wrath. And by the way, you can go all the way back to an early heretic by the name of Marcion who bifurcated between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Here's what Marcion said. Marcion said, and Marcionites after him said, we don't worship the God of the Old Testament. In fact, they don't even read the Old Testament. Or they'll throw the Old Testament out for lack, out for lack of a better term. Uh, but our God is the God of the New Testament. Our God is Jesus, you know. And, and are y'all tracking with me? And so again, um, here we come across a very clear statement that God is a God of wrath. And we just want to be careful that we have a full-orbed understanding of the character of God. Is he a God of infinite love? God is love, absolutely. But he's also a God of wrath. And he hates sin, and he will pour out judgment. And um, it's very clear here in the book of Revelation. You can't come this far through the seven seals and through the seven trumpets and be standing right on the precipice of the seven bowls, not to have come to grips with the fact that he is not to be um, trifled with. He is a God of wrath. And so here, um, these ones who got drunk on the wine in uh, Babylon's false religion, 
and the immorality laid with Babylon, if you will, and laid with that and prostituted themselves with Babylon. Um, they're going to drink of a wine, God says. This angel says they'll drink of a wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength. It's, I wish you could see it in the Greek. It's, it's without, di in, in no way is it diluted. Um, by the way, um, I'm, you guys know I'm a teetotaler. I'm not going to run this rabbit very long. But I did studies on the word wine, oinos, and other words, um, uh, shakar in the Old Testament, some Hebrew words and that kind of thing. But basically, and at the end of the day, the modern day wine in the first century, first of all, was weak to start with. And then they would cut it with all kinds of water, literally sometimes 13 to 1 with water. Um, and so at the end of the day, there are times when the scripture speaks of unfermented wine, uses the word wine, and it's not it doesn't have any alcoholic um, uh, connotations to it whatsoever, or it's talking about fermented wine. And again, depending on how much it's been cut um, and that kind of thing. And they used to cut all of their wine with a tremendous amount of water um, and that kind of thing. But um, with that imagery, look at what he says here. It's going to be mixed in the what? Full strength of his anger so there's not going to be any cutting with water there's, he's not going to let up it's in the full strength in the cup of his anger and um and so I, you know i want you to look at that for just a moment and the reason i want you to look at it is because the, the idea there is god's going to give you something to drink and it's going to be a full cup a, a, a cup that's that's full of his wrath full of his anger um now um, there's another thing here too in ancient times um the way that they would um, um, the way that they would employ capital punishment. Okay, you know how we do it today, right? I mean, we're very civil about it. We're civilized, so we're going to put somebody down and inject them or something like that. Uh, but in the ancient days, the way that they would uh, employ um, capital punishment was they would mix poison and they would make the person drink poison. Okay? I mean, and so that is the imagery that is being here. I mean, Again, when these original seven churches heard this, they knew what was being said here, that, that God is going to mix them a drink, those that have bought in to the false prophet and to the um, Antichrist and to the dragon, those that have bought in by getting his mark and sold out and, and prostituted themselves with, with Babylon the Great. They're going to get drunk, but they're going to drink of the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And they would have understood it's just like it's a capital punishment moved by God. And look at it. We're not just talking about physical, earthly ramifications. We're talking about eternal ramifications. Look at it here. And he will be tor tormented with what? Fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Okay? So um, if you ever have someone that wants to deny number one that there's a hell and number two that there's an eternal hell these are the kind of passages you take them to um, in fact you're going to see later on in the book of revelation that those that are um, not found in the land's book of life those that are found um, as standing before the great white throne judgment they're going to be taken and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire and it's 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 uh it's gehenna it's final hell where the false prophet and the beast are not where they were and they burned up jehovah's witnesses believe that in something called annihilationalism what that means is a jehovah's witness believes that if you're not um saved in their sense of the word that you know if you're not a believer at the end of the day god's going to cast you into the fire and then you just burn up and disintegrate and there's no more of you but that's a direct contradiction in other words they don't believe in an eternal hell that's a direct contradiction of passages like this that say they'll be tor tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up, how long? Forever and ever. It's a continual smoke that goes up forever and ever. Now, I don't have time here to run this rabbit, but um, in Jerusalem there, um, I want to say, let's see, north, south, east, um, on the south side of Jerusalem, there's a valley there, and it's the Valley of Hinnom. 
and um, it was a trash pile back in the first century and back in, in, in even going back even before that. Um, and so there's a valley there where they would dump all their trash, um, even, even um, you know, carcasses from animals. Um, it was a place, it was a dump. Um, and I, I think I've even read, if my memory serves me correctly, um, if uh, people died that didn't have proper places of burial and they would throw their bodies in that area. But um, they would set it on fire. It was on fire. It's a, the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, and so that smoke there in, in Jerusalem, you can imagine the stench there, but that, that smoke and that fire would be burning um, daily for them. And the word Gehenna carries with it, and that's the fine, there's, there's more than one word for the word hell in the Scripture. And Gehenna is a word that is used even on the lips of Jesus. And Gehenna carries with it the idea of that word picture where you've got a fire eternally burning um, that... Um, uh, that burns forever and ever. And so that's what you have here in verse 11. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest. When? Day and night. Okay? So again, do they burn up? Does that mean they're annihilated? No, they have no rest. That might be the saddest words in all the Scripture. Can you, here, here's a description of hell. We know what the Bible says about hell. Eternal darkness, uh, Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, no exits there. No exits in hell. But get this. No rest. Now I've heard people say, you know what, I just believe the hellfire stuff in the Bible, it's a word picture. It's a metaphor. Um, I don't believe in literal flames. I've heard people say that. And let me just say this. Um, even if it is a metaphor, a word picture, um, anytime you have word pictures and metaphors in the scripture, the reality is always worse than the word picture or the metaphor. Are y'all tracking with me a little bit? So even if you say, I don't believe in literal flames, I believe that's just a metaphor. When you add up everything the Bible has to say, um, if they're not literal flames, there's something that then it, it's worse than literal flames. Does that make sense a little bit? So that's not going get, to get anybody off the hook if they say um, something uh, of that nature. So, um, and by the way, guys, I don't like talking about hell, um, but you say, Vern, isn't it kind of unloving to talk about hell? Jesus spoke more about hell. You can look this up in, in the words in red, okay? Words in red in your Bible, a red letter edition means they're the words of Jesus, right? Listen to this. He spoke more about hell than he did heaven. Just a fact. Um, and he spoke a lot about money too, by the way, for those of us that don't, those that don't like preachers talking about money. He talked a lot about money because where your heart is, uh, you know, where your treasure is, there, there's, there will your heart be also. But um, these, are, these are why we believe in the doctrine of hell. I don't like it any more than you do. Uh, there was a famous um, um, preacher by the name of Rob Bell, I doubt any of you have heard of him. Our youngsters might know that name, our young adults particularly. Rob Bell was a famous uh, preacher um, that came to the conclusion, and he's not alone. Uh, a lot of um, liberal um, uh, uh, theologians and a lot of liberal Christians come to this conclusion, but he came to the conclusion that there was no hell. Um, he wrote a book. Um, he, he wrote one book. His earlier stuff was pretty orthodox to a degree although it was always on the line but then he wrote a book recently called love wins and so love wins everybody goes to heaven it's universalism there is no eternal hell and so that's you know a guy by the name of rob bell and 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 um he he's in, he's in the minority there's no doubt but i want you to know he's not alone in that kind of thinking people read this stuff and and especially modern day guys just can't square a God of love with a God who burns people forever and ever and ever. And, um, and, and so they will deviate or they will default. They will default to a place of universalism or annihilationalism where you just say, well, I just believe they burn up because that's not a very loving thing for God to do as to burn somebody up forever and ever and ever. And frankly, they don't understand um, the, uh, the, uh, the character of God and his hatred towards sin. And they don't understand the seriousness of sin. Okay? All right, so um, 
who, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of the beast, they're the ones that are burning there. Uh, verse 12, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Now, um, this is one of those uh, passages that come out in the book of uh, Revelation that's almost like a diamond in the rough. You've got all of this judgment. I mean, didn't we just spend a great deal of time talking about God's wrath, his judgment, hell, and all that stuff? Then it's almost as if the Holy Spirit just slips something in for the seven churches. Judgment's coming. Lost people, this is what you're going to, to receive. Earth dwellers, this is what's in your future. But then, uh, this is what John writes. Here is the perseverance. What does your translation have there? Patience. Um, perseverance, uh, hupomone, if I'm not mistaken in the Greek, it carries with it the idea of abiding under. Here is the perseverance, the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. In other words, this is just a little message for the seven churches. Stay with it, persevere, trust in Jesus, don't give in to the false world that's around you, don't sell out to idolatry, hold the uh, hold the line stay 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 with Jesus there and keep your faith in Christ verse 13 here's where we'll, we will end tonight and I'll pick up the reapers next week and I heard a voice from heaven saying right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on yes says the spirit so that they may rest from their labors their deeds uh, for their deeds follow with them okay so um uh, Miss Marcia knows that this is the text that the Lord gave me for her dad and uh, for their family. And it might be an odd text, but when you begin to look at it um, um, in, in a very unique way, uh, this is one of those odd places in the Scripture or a unique place in the Scripture where it goes contrary to what you and I might think. Um, you and I think that death is a curse, right? Uh, when, when nobody likes funerals. Uh, there, in, in no way would we say death is a blessing in the flesh. But that's exactly what John says here. Blessed are the dead. Blessed. That word there is makarios, and it means rejoice. It's the same word for rejoice. And by the way, that's the same word in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit? Blessed are, blessed... That's the word makarios, and um, it means happy. It means, um, that means more than that, but it means happy, blessed, um, joyful. Uh, you can rejoice, you know. Uh, rejoicing or blessed are the dead. Now, how can death be a blessing? I mean, after all, it's a result of the curse, going back to the Garden of Eden. How can uh, uh, death be a blessing? Those who die in the Lord from now on. And so um, death here is considered a blessing. And, um, and, and so um, I, I drew three things from this text. Uh, that people in heaven, first of all, are rejoicing. And that's uh, based on the word there, uh, blessed, makarios. Uh, they're going to be rejoicing. Secondly, here's the reason death is a blessing. Not only are people in heaven rejoicing, but um, um, look at uh, there, verse 13. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may what? Rest from their labors. So not only are they rejoicing, number two, they're resting. There's a resting that takes place in heaven. And uh, so um, when we get to heaven, as much as we work down here for the Lord or as much as we work down here, I want you to know there's going to be a rest, an eternal rest. Um, by the way, the writer of Hebrews picks up on that word rest going all the way back to the Old Testament where the children of Israel were called to enter into their rest. Much like the Lord entered into his rest after creation. How many days did, did the Lord create the world? Six, right. And then on the seventh day, what did the Lord do? Rested, okay? So um, the writer of Hebrews says the children of Israel um, um, wouldn't enter into their rest um, and the, the New Testament, the New Covenant carries with it the idea of when we gain Christ, when we trust in Jesus, we enter an eternal rest in our Lord. 
And so um, heaven for us is something that we've already experienced in Jesus, but this is even in a greater way because they will rest from their labors. Our work will be done, okay? And then finally, not only is there rejoicing in heaven and resting in heaven, this is the reason death is a blessing, but finally there's a reward uh, in heaven for their deeds will follow them. And that's not a bad thing. The reason there's a blessing is because deeds following them are going to be the good deeds that they did and so they're going to be rewarded when they get to heaven um, uh, so just real quick let me just say something if you have a loved one right now and I know there's some of us in here in fact a few more than a few of us in here who have a loved one that's in heaven I can tell you three things from this text they're rejoicing they're resting and they're going to be rewarded. And it's straight from the text. And that's consistent with everything else we find in the New, New and the Old Testament. And uh, so you can understand that death, as hard as it was for you, was a blessing for them. Okay? Love you guys so very much. Next week we'll pick up the reapers and uh, we'll finish up verses 14 through 20. Um, I can't wait to talk to you about more judgment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there in those verses so maybe it's a blessing that we end on on some good news uh god bless you and um we'll see you next week all right i'm gonna go preach to these youth <laughs>